get to the thought where we left off the last time we were together, beginning in verse number 25. Acts chapter 9 and verse number 25. The Bible says, Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went out to slay him. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarshish. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost and were multiplied. The last time that we were together, we began to speak about the conversion of Saul. We looked at the vision uh, that God had given to Saul. You remember Saul was a very wicked man, but a very intelligent man. He was a trained man. He knew at least five languages. We learned that he was not the best of looking people. He was not the tallest of people, but he was a very educated man, and he knew the Old Testament by heart. He was on the Sanhedrin, and we learned that he was also a married man at one time. We learned much about him, but he had a hatred towards the things of Christianity because he thought that Christianity was coming to destroy Judaism. In so doing, he took it into his own hands and had the life of Stephen martyred. Though he may have never thrown a stone, he had others do it for him. And the clothes of Stephen were ripped off of his body and placed into the hands of Saul. And Saul is now ravaging. His teeth are biting to get his next thing, that next Christian to stop them from becoming more Christians in the future. He was tearing families apart. He was ripping wives and fathers and children apart, throwing them in prison. And sometimes some were killed in the doing. Well, he is made aware that down in Damascus, there's a large group of Christians that are there. And he has made word that he is on his way to go and stop this thing of Christianity before it spreads any further than what it already has. It's already started in Jerusalem. It's already got to Samaria through Philip, but now it's got to Damascus and he's got to do something about that. The Sanhedrin puts him on a charge that he must go and on his way there, something magical happens as the voice of God, a vision of God comes. It wasn't just a light. It wasn't some clouds that just parted away like maybe some images put out. No, he fell off of his animal and he looked up and he saw none other than the Son of God himself. That is a very significant thing because he saw Jesus Christ right after the resurrection making him qualified to be an apostle. We understand that there are some today that say that they are a, a apostle but that is not possible because they must see Jesus Christ after the resurrection and Paul himself or at this time Saul saw Jesus Christ but he didn't just see Jesus he heard Jesus speak to him and he said Saul Saul why persecutest thou and he persecuted the church and Saul so much was scared to death he lost blind he went blind he couldn't eat for several days he saw a vision of the son of God and may I say when you come into the encounter of the Lord Jesus Christ you won't be the same either and that's what happened with Saul he would never be the same from this point forward he'll never never be a Christian killer anymore, but he will be an edifier of the saints. We find that there's a vision of the Son of God, then a visitation by the servant of God. We find about Ananias is sent that direction to go and give not only food uh, to Saul, but to help him and train him and lay hands upon him so that he may be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Now we understand that the book of Acts is a transitional book. It is a historical book, though it does contain uh, doctrinal uh, subjects. It is not necessarily a book we look to for 
for doctrine because right here would mess up a lot of things because Ananias put his hands on Saul and gave him the Holy Spirit. We don't do that today. You don't see Pastor Dean, you don't see myself or any other preacher putting their hands upon somebody and giving them the Holy Spirit. No, the moment you call upon Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're baptized by the Holy Spirit immediately, right then and there. We have said this all the way from Acts chapter 2 up to now. There is only one baptism, but there are many fillings of the Spirit of God. The problem in our churches today is many of us are not filled with the Spirit of God. That's the reason we're not speaking boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. After he is given the Holy Spirit and he's baptized and made a public identification there to the church, he goes back to the synagogue and he's going there because that's where he's going to reach the people there in Damascus. The last time we were together, I told you what a sight that must have been. You have the priest that he's there. He's been looking forward to having this great preacher, this great saint, this great intellectual mind, Saul, come and tell them what they're supposed to do about these Christians, how they're supposed to throw them in prison, where to find them, what are they supposed to do before this Christianity thing goes forward. I can imagine that priest there in that synagogue, he was looking forward to having his scrolls signed uh, by Saul. He was looking forward uh, to being with Saul and having that fellowship with Saul and maybe picking at his brain. But he didn't know that Saul had a change in his life. He invited him in. He walked through the synagogue. He got behind the pulpit and everybody got in a hush of a silence waiting to see what this great man Saul was going to tell them. They were never going to imagine what he would say next. He wasn't going to say that Jesus was a cult leader. He wasn't going to say that Jesus was a false prophet. He wasn't going to say that Jesus was simply a witch or a magician that performed miracles. No, he comes behind the pulpit. He leans down the microphone and he says, I want to preach to you a message today. Jesus is the Son of God. And you can imagine that priest fell back on his chair. There was a gas that happened in that synagogue as nobody expected that to come from the mouth of Saul of Tarshish. Saul then would be ran out of town and went to a desert and spent three years there in Holy Ghost University. He would come back and he would begin to preach and prove that Jesus was the Son of God. We spoke about how sometimes people have to prove that Jesus is the real deal, that Jesus is real. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. You know, today in Israel, the Jews, they still are looking for the Messiah though he came over 2,000 years ago and was born of a virgin by the name of Mary. They're still looking for him. And that's where you and I come in, that we have to be able to prove the scriptures sometimes to people. The Bible speaks about how Gentiles are seekers after knowledge while Jews are seekers after signs. And here in America, there's no doubt that we are looking after knowledge. You may not look at it when you look at the public schools and you find kids that are in ninth or 10th grade and barely could read. But it seems that we definitely are in a time where there's more knowledge available, but so few are really looking for it entirely. That's where you and I come in. We must know something about the word of God so that we can prove that Jesus Christ came to die for sinners so that they may be saved and go to heaven. Uh, Paul, he, or Saul here, he not only protest uh, was pastored by Ananias, but he preached Jesus Christ. And we come to these verses here this morning where we learn about a voice of the servant of God. Saul is in trouble. As the people there in Damascus have heard the message about Jesus being the Son of God. And they didn't approve this message very much. He has now spent his time in the desert. He has returned. He's preached the same message he was preaching three years before. He's come back. He's still preaching a message that never gets old. And may I say the gospel message was not just the time back in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. It's still relevant here today as it has been for 2,000 years. He preached that same message and he proved that message not only with knowledge, but he did so with a changed life. He was not the same Saul that everybody knew. 
You know, there's some people, they start out, it looks like there's a change, but it doesn't take long till there's no change at all in their life. You don't think they got the real thing, but now it's been three years has passed and Saul has stuck to his guns. There was a real change that happened there on the Damascus Road. May you write this down this morning as this is the gist of the entire lesson. The strongest argument against the Bible is a bad life. The strongest argument against the Bible is a bad life. Saul could have been one of the greatest hindrances to the gospel message had he lived a bad life after his conversion. But we learn that he had a good testimony. This morning I primarily want to speak to you about the importance of a good testimony testimony. The importance of a good testimony. The people of Damascus had had enough with God's messenger. Word has spread to the ears as well as the church that Saul is in trouble. You remember that the people in Damascus, there were two groups. There was a group that was looking forward to having Saul come. And there was also a group, the church, that was not looking forward to Saul coming. But now it's reversed. Now that one group that was looking for, they want him out of town. They want to kill him. But now the church is wanting to help him. And they've got word that he's in trouble. They're waiting to kill him. And they do everything they can. The church has now got baskets. Or they try to let him out through the gate in the night and get him out of there. Because they know that Saul is God's man. He's God's messenger preaching. God's word and they let him out by the way of a basket. Now we the people who are the church we need to be like this church there in Damascus in helping God's messenger when he's in trouble. You know sometimes when you preach the truth you're going to be hated. If they hated Jesus they're going to hate you and I if we stand for righteousness. And they hated Saul because he was preaching truth. And they hated truth. You see, they did something that they only could do. And that was they had to help him and protect him because the devil was out against him. Just as the devil is out against men today who are filled or filling in the office of a pastor. The devil is out against today women who try to teach Sunday school classes. The devil is out against men who are trying to lead their homes biblically. The devil is out against women who are trying to live a holy and separated life. We as the church though need to be encouragers in this day and try to help one another because we know that the devil is trying to stop us from going forward and living a conformed and holy and separated life and doing what the church ought to do in getting that gospel message. When we come to this place, it's not to show off our outfits. It's not to get a hand in hand. No, it's to come and try to encourage one another, find edification, learn more about our Savior, and then go out into this world and do it what we learn here. But throughout the week of the six days of the week, all the way to Sunday, it's hard. It's discouraging sometimes, especially around the holidays, when you try to reach out to that family member and they just say, I want nothing to do with you. You try to reach out to that coworker. They won't want to hear that message. And sometimes that can be discouraging. But you come into the house of God and you hear somebody that says, I've been praying for my sister. I've been praying for my brother. I've been praying for that coworker. And I got them the gospel. And it only took 20, 30 years. But they finally got saved. And you hear that. You shout with them. You get encouraged with them. And you say, if God did it for them, he can do it in my life and my family family as well. You see, the church ought to be a place where we are known for being encouragers. And here's how you can be an encouragement to your fellow churchmen. You can pray for one another. 
We have mentioned just a moment ago about many prayer request needs, many that are sick, many that are going through trials right now. There are many of you that have come to me privately and you have told me things in your family, in your life, and we're praying together about those things. Sometimes that's the best thing to do is share that need, share that with somebody so they can help pray. You find great encouragement in that. But we also can encourage one another in words. We've talked about this before, saying something. Sometimes a text is good. Sometimes a letter is very special. But sometimes just saying a kind word to somebody can mean so much. You remember that Paul even talks about that with the church of Philippi, that he got refreshed because of their words that they gave to him, how they encouraged him. Your words can be refreshing to somebody that's so thirsty and in need of encouragement. We also not only can pray for one another and encourage one another in words, but we can work with one another. You know, sometimes people get discouraged in the work of the Lord because they're the only ones doing it. Burns out so many because they're doing 20 different jobs at the church, and then you got some that are doing nothing. And that can be discouraging, and they feel like if they, do, if they leave or they do something, everything falls apart. It ought, ought to be like that. We ought to try to help carry one another's burdens and help do the work of the gospel together. It should not just be pastor. It should not just be me. It should not just be Brother Tom. It should not just be Brother Carter. It should not just be uh, Brother Josh. It should not just be. It should be all of us working together. You say, well, I want a church like the church down the street. No, I don't want a church like that. I want a church like we find here in the book of Acts that they were working together for the gospel's sake. That's the church I want Whitehorse Heights to be. They work together. But we find here, when we come here to verse number 26, something is startling. Saul has been let free. He's got out of Damascus by the way of a basket. And Saul is on his way to Jerusalem. Now remember, the last time he was in Jerusalem, he stoned somebody. His name was Stephen. The last time everybody there in Jerusalem knew about Saul, they knew him as a killer of a Christian. But now he's going back to Jerusalem where the Sanhedrin is, where his old buddies are. He's going there, but he's going there not to meet with them first. He's going to assemble himself with God's assembly. And he's meeting with the disciples. And the Bible says in verse number 26, when he shows up, they were all afraid of him. Do you blame them? The last time they knew about Saul, he was killing people. Now Saul is saying, hey, I'm one of you. I'm sure the disciples were thinking this man must be a wolf in sheep's clothing. They thought maybe he's putting on a front. They haven't heard about him in about three years, but they remember him from three years ago. They were scared of him. They were skeptical of him. They didn't want to believe that he was one of them. They didn't want to believe that he was a child of God. They didn't want to believe that he was a Christian. They didn't want to believe that he was God's messenger. They were skeptical. And by the way, that's understandable. Very understandable in their situation. We got to remember when we read the Bible, we have the entire story. We know all about the bad parts of Saul, but we also know about the good parts of Saul. The Bible is a very interesting book because it gives us the whole story. Don't you hate those television shows and those books that say to be continued and you've got to wait another week or you've got to wait for the next book to come out because you want to know what's next but sometimes the season gets canceled or the book is never written and you're on a cliffhanger. But I'm thankful that the Bible doesn't give us a cliffhanger. It always gives the whole story and it gives the whole story. But here's the problem that you and I face in our modern day. There's nothing wrong with being skeptical about one salvation. Christ actually encouraged you and I to judge one another by their fruits. You always hear people say, judge not lest you be judged, but they got to keep going in the context. It does teach us that we are to judge one another by their fruits if they really are saved. It's okay to be skeptical as long as we're not discouragers because we don't always know the whole story. I was with a man earlier this week up in Charlotte. 
And this man was a rather heavy set man and he was covered from head to toe with tattoos up and down his body. He was a very kind man, a very generous man. He was wearing a t-shirt along the lines of saying Jesus saves and things like that. And I spoke with him for just a little while and he had got saved just a few years ago. But if I looked at him without asking him, if I didn't see that t-shirt, if I didn't know that, I would think this is one rough, tough dude that's probably some biker somewhere and all this. And I would have been scared to death. But this was a very kind man, almost like a teddy bear kind of dude, just the way he was because Jesus had done something in his life. I didn't need to know the whole story, but I knew what God had done in his life by the way he was presenting him so there was fruit of repentance I get concerned about people that say that they're saved, but there's no change. They continue to listen to the same music. They continue to dress the same ways. They continue to speak the same things. You remember even Peter was questionable and skeptical because you remember Peter cussed out people by saying that he was identifying himself with Jesus. Most of us would be skeptical to think if Peter was actually saved. It's okay to be skeptical, but we all know Peter's the one that preached at Pentecost. We all do mess up. We all do have faults. But there's nothing wrong with us being skeptical and looking at somebody. Be careful, though. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer for somebody in their outward appearance. You've got to look on the inward appearance. Sometimes it may take time in their life for them to grow in the grace of God. Not all of us just had a cold turkey moment and all of it changed. Some did, but some didn't. We got to be careful not to get so skeptical that we actually push somebody away from the assembly. You know what they need more than anything is to come into the assembly and find encouragement that they are loved in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they can find help, that God can use them no matter what they've done. They ought to find that, but in some churches I've been to, you look at them, they're not in a tie, they're not in a suit, they're not in a dress, they got tattoos down the body, and people maybe with good intentions, they push them away. That ought not to be said of this church or any church. We ought not to be that way. We ought to give the benefit of the doubt that they really got the real thing. Uh, it's not for me to know whether they're saved or not. We can judge the fruit. The only person I know in this room alone that is saved is myself. Just like you're the only one in your, this room that knows if you're saved. We all have to grow. We're all at different steps in our Christian life. And Saul is, is at an interesting point because his own people, the disciples, they were scared of him. They were skeptical of him, and that's understandable. They believed not him. And that's why God had to raise up a voice for him. And his name is not other than Barnabas. In verse number 27 it says, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and he had spoken to him, and now he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. I appreciate the life of Barnabas. We learned about him back in Acts chapter number 4. You remember after Peter and John, uh, they are arrested and uh, they were trying to figure out what to do with Peter and John. Finally, they just had to let them go. The, they go to a prayer meeting in the house of God. They're all meeting together, worshiping and praising God. And then you find Barnabas just gives everything he has to the church. And we find that everybody likes Barnabas. He's a good man. We've learned some things about Barnabas actually here in the the word of God. For example, Barnabas actually means uh, he is a peacemaker. That's what his name means. He's also known as a great encourager. He is found 30 different times in the New Testament alone in four separate books of the New Testament. Barnabas was a man with a good testimony. And when you have a good testimony, people start to listen. He was known for being a peacemaker. He was known for being an encourager. He had a good testimony that when he stood up and he spoke up for right, people listened. Now what kind of testimony do you and I have? What are we known for? Are we known for being peacemakers? Are we known for being people that encourage other people? Are we known for being soul winners? 
Uh, what are we known for? Are we prayer warriors? What are we known for? I'm not talking about just this church. I'm talking about you individually. Whether lost or whether saved, what do people view you as? What is your testimony? Are you one that comes in and you're known as being the hypocrite? You say one thing one way and then you do something else the other. Uh, you're not known for bringing people together, but you're known for tearing people apart. Let me say that knowing tearing people apart is not Christ-like at all. We all ought to have a testimony that we are being conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. They ought to see Jesus in our life, and if they can't, there's a problem. There's a problem. Barnabas came to the side of Paul in his defense, and he spoke up at the risk of being wrong. Do you, you not know well that Barnabas at least at one time maybe one little thought came into his mind of doubt that he could be wrong. There have been many times that I've stood up for somebody thinking that they were right only to find out that they were actually in the wrong. We've all been there. We've all been guilty of that. That's why we've got to make sure that we pray and we ask God for guidance. God's not going to lead us to do the wrong thing. That's why it's so important that we're filled with the Spirit of God. But sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we make the wrong decision and we don't stand up for the right thing or we stand up for the wrong thing rather. Uh, you think that Barnabas could have thought maybe, maybe he's wrong, but he said, man, Saul has a good testimony. Saul really has been preaching. Saul really did see Jesus and I'm going to defend him with every right that I have as a, even in the chance of it messing up my testimony. At this point, Barnabas has a great testimony. And if Barnabas is wrong, it's going to affect his testimony. That's why it ought to be so careful of all of us where we attend, who we stand with, etc., because we got to make sure that we are not going to be a hindrance to somebody's eternity. You know, the testimony you and I have among men and women saved or lost is so important. It can actually affect somebody's eternity. And may we never forget that. Never forget it. I'm afraid many today are burning in hell because of somebody's bad testimony. I believe today we ought to strive to live peaceably among all good men where it is possible, according to Romans 12. You can't always do that. That's why it says, if it is possible. But we ought to strive to have that kind of testimony that we try to live peaceably. We ought to strive to be charitable and live lives like that among men. We ought to strive to live like Jesus. We ought to strive to live just as the Bible teaches us. Because if we're not, we could affect somebody's eternity. Lost or saved. I'm afraid that there are many people burning in hell because they saw somebody that said that they were a Christian, but there was no change in their life. They say, why would I have anything to do with Christianity? Why would I have anything to do? Y'all go to church on Sundays. I can sleep into 12 o'clock. Y'all got to get up at 9 or 10 to get over here to church. And you got to buy clothes that look all nice. I, I'd rather go buy an Xbox or a PlayStation or buy some more Budweiser's and have a good time and have no uh, accountability. I'd rather live life. But then they look at you and you're doing the same thing. Why would they want anything to do with what you got? I'm afraid we got to really think about that with every action that we do, everything that we post on social media, everything we say to somebody, even in private, you better be careful that you can trust somebody with that. Barnabas, he stands up for Saul. But it is a rather sad commentary when we come to verse number 29. Where the Bible says, And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. That tells you and I that there were some in the city of Jerusalem who went about to destroy and kill the Apostle Paul. They were not the religious crowd only. This was some of the church. People that were still scared, still skeptical about him, they said, we don't want anything to do with him. And they pushed him out of town and sent him back to his own city where he grew up there in Tarshish. They sent him back. I'm sure that these people were good people. 
I'm sure these people loved God with all of their heart, but they were wrong for doing so. This is a very sad commentary and tells you and I indeed upon a religious life of the early days of the church. I'm afraid with good intentions, some of us perhaps have ran off good men and women that have come into the church. Maybe with good intentions we had. We thought we were protecting our children. We thought we were protecting the name of our church. We thought we were making sure that the carpet didn't get too dirty and the hymn books didn't get crayons all over them. We were thinking things like that. We had good intentions. We wanted to make sure things were nice. We wanted to protect, and that's good. But sometimes we handle the situation wrongly. And we push somebody away that we could have helped and help them to grow in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Religion can be a good thing, but religion can also be a, be a very hurtful thing. How many have been hurt by religion rather than helped? Because people with good intentions. We find not only the testimony of Barnabas, but we find the testimony of the bride of Christ. Look at verse 31. The Bible says, Then had the churches rest throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, and were multiplied. We find that they rested. What does that mean? Things have kind of calmed down there in Jerusalem to the sense of persecution because now you don't have Saul leading the charge. The church can actually rest a little bit and they can go forward with the Great Commission. They can actually spend time someplace in some house worshiping and singing songs and learning more about the scriptures. They can rest. They were engaged now in the work of God like they had never been before. But they were also edified, meaning that they were helped. When we come to this place, we ought to be helped by the singing. We ought to be helped by the preaching or the teaching that is done in this place. And if we're not, we're doing something very wrong. But they were helped, they were edified. And now the church is going to go on. And they're going to preach there in Jerusalem. But something that startles me and bothers me about the testimony of the brethren was that they were scared and that they were skeptical. But now everything's okay. But it took somebody having to stand up for a man. You know, it's very interesting that in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, they're told that they are to go into all the world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, starting there in Jerusalem, going to Judea, both in Judea and Samaria, and eventually the uttermost parts of the earth. But up until we get to Acts chapter number, I believe, uh, 6, we haven't seen that. It took until the deacons were put in there. Stephen's the one that got it started. It took somebody dying before the gospel got scattered into the uttermost parts of the earth. It took Philip, another deacon, going to Samaria, just like it was said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And it's because now that God had to look past the apostles for a little while and find new men, now a man that's going to go to the Gentiles, and he's going to preach and do a great work for the Lord Jesus Christ because the apostles never got out of Jerusalem. Let me say this in passing, that if God can't use you to do what he wanted to do, he'll find somebody else to do it. All of us are replaceable. All of us. And God had a man set up when the apostles weren't going to do what they were supposed to do, and he raised up a new apostle, and his name was Saul. His name will later change to the apostle Paul. We'll talk about that. He'll be taken to a Mediterranean Sea village there in Syria while the church there in Jerusalem continue to grow and tell others that glorious gospel message. It was the church there in Damascus that rescued Paul. And now it was the church here in Jerusalem that sent Paul to Caesarea there to Tarsus. And that's how the church ought to be. Sometimes we have to come in and rescue the parishim. We spend time edifying, helping them to grow, and then we have to send them off. Not because we don't like them, but they've got to go out and do the Great Commission. It should be very common for all of us to see people come in and people go. 
not for wrong reasons, but we should be excited when we find men that we can say we're going to support them monthly because they're going off to a foreign field. They're going off to start a church. They're going off to help somebody. It ought not to be just the preachers like myself. It ought to be all of us. The church is a place that comes and we grow. We come and we go. But some people go to church just to sit and die. And they never go out and do what they're supposed to do. Oh, may we learn some great testimonies here.